Oh my god, hey! Welcome back to my stage YouTube channel. I have neighbours, it's very late. If you are meeting me for the first time, then howdy, y'all! My name is Mickey Joe, and I am obsessed with all things theatre. I am a theatre critic based here in the UK and a stagey content creator on YouTube. Earlier this week, I was invited to go and review the West End transfer of. Oklahoma, the Daniel Fish production of Oklahoma, seen on Broadway, currently touring around the US, or recently touring around the US, I believe it transferred over here to the Young Vic Theatre, an off West End venue in a very intimate staging, and I did a video review of that last summer when I went to go and see that production. It has now transferred to the Wyndham's Theatre in the West End, where it retains much of its same features, but in a more traditional proscenium staging. So rather than having the audience on three sides of the stage in a more intimate venue, it is now in traditional West End venue, kind of spilling out from the stage, but still performing to the audience face on. This changes the show in many ways, and I do think it merits talking about, again, there have also been some tiny little changes in the casting as well. So I'm going to be bringing you my updated review of Oklahoma in the West End today. Did I think that this shift in its staging harmed the production and what it was trying to achieve with its immersive vibe, or did I actually like it more in this format. By the end of today's review, you will find out. If you enjoyed today's video, make sure to subscribe to my Stagey YouTube channel. If you click on the link in the description, you could also sign up to become one of my YouTube members. For just £2.99 a month, you will gain access to early content and also my exclusive videos, such as my First Impressions series. There is a second link in the description, and if you click that one, you can sign up for a free account with ShowScore. Not only will you be automatically following some of the written reviews that I do for publications like whatsonstage.com and Broadway World UK, but you will also be able to create your own profile and rate and review shows that you've seen in either the West End or on Broadway. Now, let's talk about Oklahoma. So this is a very polarizing revival, and if you don't know anything about it at all, I want to just start by explaining what the difference is. So Oklahoma is a golden age Rodgers and Hammerstein musical, right? And it was one of the first original book musicals to use script and lyrics and music and dance in a cohesive way to achieve storytelling and to further a narrative. It was one of the first shows to really do that. So in its own time, it was groundbreaking, but looking back at it now, however many decades later, it possibly can feel a little bit dated to intrepid and exciting young theatre goers. So director Daniel Fish has been developing this contemporary version of the show that retains all of the original spoken and sung material. There are no changes to the script or to the lyrics, but the way that it is staged, the way that it is designed and directed subverts your expectation of the story. So we have these characters who are dressed in a contemporary way, and we have this kind of contemporary minimalist set. They're cracking open cans of beer, they're wearing jeans, you get the idea. And from the beginning, you can tell that there is something slightly unusual about it. We have Curly, the protagonist, accompanying himself on the acoustic guitar. The songs have been rearranged in completely different styles. They feel acoustic and contemporary. There are some amazing and thrilling moments where this score sounds way more contemporary than it used to. We have some like big power ballad rock moment in the Dream Ballet, which we will talk about in March, more detail later, because that's a fever dream all of its own. And the show makes incredibly expressive use of lighting as well. And some of the later scenes in the second act are kind of turned on their head to make you question parts of the story that you'd always taken for granted. And the person that you look at as an antagonist is maybe portrayed in a different light. And so you leave the theatre asking questions about this story that you never previously would have. I think the idea with this is to make it feel a lot more urgent and vital and modern and for its themes to be resonating with a modern audience rather than looking at it as this period piece that is no longer applicable to our society. And in many ways that's what a revival should be, but at the same time a lot of people come to the theatre for something diverting and entertaining and uplifting and they don't want to be confronted by something so harsh and intense, especially when they're going to a golden age classic. So like I said before, it's a polarising production. People have very strong opinions about this production of Oklahoma and today you're going to hear mine. 
So I believe I gave this a four star review while it was at the Young Vic. I said it was very bold. It took some very big swings. I liked, you know, the intentions that it had. I didn't think every single choice paid off necessarily. Um, I liked most of them, but there were a few that I just didn't fully understand or I thought where maybe the concept seemed to be a little half baked in some moments. And I remember sitting in the Young Vic Auditorium and just feeling tense. It does many things to deliberately put you on edge. And when a show is sort of staged in this immersive way, as everything is these days, it seems, and it takes steps to emotionally alienate you from itself, that can be a little bit confusing. And for what it's worth, I actually enjoy the staging a lot more in a proscenium version at the Wyndham's. So this is still a four star review from me. I think there are still a couple of slightly dizzying moments of the show, but I do think I enjoyed it more this time. The overview of why that is, is because when we have it as a proscenium staging, I think it's easier for your eye to be guided as to where Daniel Fish, the director, wants you to be looking. There was a particular moment after Patrick Vale has sung his beautiful solo song in the first act where he is kept at the front of the stage and the following scene carries on behind him. But we have him lingering there and we see his reaction to this and it juxtaposes his raw humanity with the conversation that is happening sort of in spite of him subsequently where they're not really being at all considerate of his feelings he's very readily dismissed and i think in a traditional version of the show where he just leaves the stage and we go on to these other characters we wouldn't necessarily consider him but by positioning him front and center we have to we are forced to as an audience and in the young vic i never knew where to look there was far too much going on it was a visual feast and so the proscenium staging the traditional staging at the wyndham's theater gives the direction a little bit more potency i think i also think because of the way that it situates its audience emotionally i think this is a show that is a lot easier to look at inside of a fishbowl and i think that's something i'm just more comfortable with as an audience member anyway i'm not the biggest fan of being completely immersed in something i know some people will take the opposite view of this to me but i would much rather do what feels like emotional voyeurism and just look in on a situation and analyze it from afar and from the safe confines of my seat and i think that's what this production really needs we are studying something and we are seeing it in different lights literally where it's being lit in some very extreme ways more on that momentarily but i think the relationship between this show and its audience fares better in this kind of a staging so let me carry on by telling you some of my favorite moments of daniel fish's production of oklahoma So first of all, we absolutely have to talk about the lighting design by Scott Zielinski. It's incredible and it's so off-putting and unexpected when you walk into this auditorium and the whole thing is so brightly lit and then the house lights don't go down. You are in just full light as an audience for I'd say at least the first 15, 20 minutes of the show. And then there's this sudden random shift where everything, I believe it first turns green or perhaps it's orange. And I mean, literally just like the world you're living in has suddenly turned green or orange. Like when you used to put on like those 3D glasses that had like the red and the blue, that's what it looks like. And as well as being representative of different themes and like desire and jealousy and all of that good stuff, it just introduces this level of tension that is going to be continued throughout the rest of the show. The whole thing has felt very bright and open at the beginning, which is, you know, warm, but also inescapable at the same time. I think the whole thing has this duality of sort of pretending to be very accessible, but deliberately putting you on edge throughout. One of the most shocking moments of this show is when the stage and the auditorium is plunged into complete pitch black darkness for a prolonged amount of time. And I don't think you can even really process quite how this feels until you're sitting in an auditorium that close to so many other people and you're all sharing this moment of darkness and it focuses you so acutely on the delivery of each of the lines that are being spoken in that scene on stage and they're using a microphone to do this so that you can hear every single breath and every single whisper and hesitation and it comes across so very intensely we have light slowly coming back up there's one particular effect 
with a spotlight coming down so that when a gun is shot, we see the smoke rising slowly up from it. That's just incredible. I mean, there are some really fantastic lighting moments throughout. They make excellent use of haze. There's another dark moment in the second act. There's just a lot of really wonderful lighting done in this show. For some reason, this show's lighting was not nominated for an Olivier Award. It was nominated for several awards, but lighting design was not one of them. That baffles me because this is some of the most exceptional lighting you can currently see in a West End theatre. And on a purely superficial note, if you're planning on taking selfies in the audience, then the pre-show lighting is great. Just so, so good. It's like you bring a ring light to your seat, honestly. Another moment that I think is really fascinating in this production is the entire auction sequence in the second act. So they are raising money for the schoolhouse and all the ladies of the community have all baked a luncheon and put it into a hamper and they brought the hampers and the guys are bidding on the hampers but it's a thinly veiled way of bidding on the women who made the hampers and this is kind of played off charmingly in the original production and in the script but the way that it's staged with them sat around and then they have each of the ladies whose hamper it is standing in the middle sort of staring sardonically and dissociatively as they're being bid on just puts across quite how creepy this entire process is and how little agency they have in, uh, in their various relationships of the time. The whole show is also overtly very sexual, like it's been nicknamed Sexy Oklahoma for a reason. In no other production of Oklahoma would you have the elderly spinster Aunt Ella making out with the peddler Ali Hakim, like that would never happen elsewhere, and I think this version's all the better for it. So now I want to talk about some of the moments of the show that I think don't necessarily work as well. And uh, for me to do this, I am going to have to give you a couple of spoilers, not only about the plot of Oklahoma, but also about this particular production. If you don't want those, you can skip ahead to the next section where I talk about the cast. So in this version of the show, the interval is positioned such that the dream ballet opens the second act. And I think if the dream ballet were to close the first act, you would have a lot of people not returning after the interval. As it is, I'm already hearing comments that apparently at various performances, there are some people who don't return after the interval. That's all here saying conjecture, and I can't say that I noticed it on press night, but then it was a press night audience, so you wouldn't expect that anyway. So traditionally in Oklahoma, the dream ballet happens where Laurie smells these smelling salts that are supposed to help her make up her mind between the two men who are trying to court her. Classic woman problems, am I right? She falls asleep in like the middle of the day, in the middle of like a field or something, and then she sees this whole dream ballet being danced by somebody else who is her in her dream, unless she's Josefina Gabrielle, in which case she dances her own dream ballet, cause she can, but not in this version. And she sees like possibilities of what's to come and this whole like scenario played out and other people are involved. And in this version of the show, as you would expect from how I've been describing it, it's very different. In a contemporary version of the show, you would expect a contemporary dream ballet. And boy, is this that. So this is danced by a lead dancer called Marie Astrid Mentz, and it involves no other members of the cast. She briefly interacts with Anushka Lucas, who plays Laurie, uh, but there aren't any other people present for the Dream Ballet. And I do think that harms it to a certain extent. For it to be as long as it is, without any of the people on stage, the storytelling of that dance becomes a little bit lost in the smoke. And I mean that very literally, because there is an enormous amount of haze that floods the stage as it begins. I love what they've done with the orchestral music at this point in having these themes, these Richard Rogers themes blasted out on electric guitar. I think that's cool. I think that's amazing. And I like the contemporary style of the choreography. It is very like contemporary dance. She's wearing this like long white t-shirt that says dream baby dream. And she's throwing herself around the stage. It begins as a gallop and then she's doing all sorts of crazy things. And she's clearly becoming increasingly contorted and uncomfortable. But I for one struggle to infer meaning from abstract contemporary dance where there is nothing else to aid you in this process of narrative. And I just don't know what it was that she was trying to put across. I've read some notes in the program about what the idea of this dream ballet is, about a woman trying to find her place in the world. I don't personally think it's possible to infer that from 
what we're seeing on stage. It, you know, it looks great. It's clearly performed very well. It sounds great, but I don't know what it means. And I find that frustrating because you could do so much with this. You could put so much storytelling into this because by and large, where they are adapting this show and trying to make it about something that it wasn't originally written to be about, and they're trying to pull new contemporary ideas out of it and new provocative themes, it's hard to do that amongst the existing text. You know, there's these things in place and they have to move around the text. In the Dream Ballet, there's no text. They could do whatever they wanted to. And so I find this moment to be a little disappointing when you consider what the possibilities could have been. The other particularly provocative moment of this revival is the ending. So we're going to get some spoilers here. Traditionally, Curly and Laurie have given up pretending that they hate each other and instantly fallen in love and quite quickly they get married. Judd, who was the other suitor for Laurie's affections, turns up on their wedding day and traditionally tries to kill Curly. They have a whole brawl and Judd falls on his own knife. Curly is then hugely apologetic and offers to turn himself in and all of the local community are like, no, we won't let your life be ruined by this. We're going to have a fake trial here and we all know that you're innocent and that we're self-defense, so we're just gonna carry out the legal process in a sort of dubious, accelerated way so that you can go on your honeymoon and we can sing the title song and everyone can forget about this ugly chapter of the show. Except what Daniel Fish wants to do is throw a spanner in the works and make you question the legitimacy of all of this. So instead, Judd arrives to the wedding and offers Curly a gun. He puts it into Curly's hand, pointing it at himself. Now, is this Judd providing Curly with an excuse to kill him as he would have wanted to anyway, uh, which arguably is what Judd does in the traditional version of the show. He gives Curly the opportunity by first attacking him. In any case, it's odd for us to see Judd then get shot completely unarmed and just standing there waiting for it to happen. And we see Curly and Laurie dressed in innocent, completely white wedding clothes, then covered in blood. They don't react to this particularly emotionally. They are just dissociative and gone and soulless. And the subsequent scene plays out with Aunt Ella being the ringleader of what then starts to feel like a community witch hunt against Judd Fry, where they are manipulating the verdict of this very dubious trial. The whole thing feels completely uncomfortable and really makes you question what you understood about the ending of this show before, which I think is clever to a certain extent. Other people really don't like this. And I think just a couple more directing decisions in this moment would help to articulate what it is that they are trying to demonstrate. Because I so get what I think it is that they're going for, but I don't know if everyone connects with this. And I think there's a powerful message to be put across here. I just think something in the offering of the gun to Curly and then the actual action of the shot needs to be clarified a little bit. I've heard commentary from some people that even got confused and thought that Curly and Laurie had been killed because they're the ones who end up covered in blood. I think what happens afterwards is very dramatically satisfying and sort of almost difficult to watch. I just wish the act itself were clearer. Possibly they like that ambiguity and they like for the audience to be asking questions, which after that scene, they certainly are. So now let's talk about some of the members of the cast. Arthur Darville and Anushka Lucas lead the production as Curly and Laurie, respectively. They do a fantastic job. This is my favorite thing I've ever seen Arthur Darville do on stage, and I've seen him in a couple of roles. He leads this with tremendous capability and bravado and brashness. I also love his voice on this. I love the ease with which he self accompanies on the acoustic guitar. I'm an acoustic guitarist, that means a lot to me. Anushka Lucas has a beautiful voice, just wonderful. I, and it's nothing to do with her, it's how she's been directed. I never quite understand Laurie's intention at many points throughout the show. She does this whole dissociative stare thing very, very well. And I just think it's possibly deliberately ambiguous, but we never really know. Even in the second act, when she has this scene in darkness where she's with Judd and she then doesn't want to be with Judd anymore, we don't know how participatory she is in this moment of intimacy between them. And you start to question her innocence as a character. I think we could lean even more into that if she were allowed to articulate her emotions a little bit more but both her and Adoani 
become very emotionally stunted and stifled in the second act. That's not a choice I particularly enjoy. I don't think stoicism really helps with anything from a narrative standpoint. So while this production was at the Young Vic, Marisha Wallace was playing the role of Ada Annie. She has since left the show to open as Miss Adelaide in Guys and Dolls, which I'll be seeing and reviewing soon, by the way. Uh, but now Ada Annie is being played by Georgina Onwara. I last saw Georgina in The Wizard of Oz at the Leicester Curve playing Dorothy Gale, and she is so good in this. Probably my favorite performance, or one of my two favorite performances, of the night. She's fantastic and she's done a great many things before this. The versatility of her as a vocalist is supreme and the way she can add in just enough head voice to make some interesting mixy moments. Loved it from a vocal standpoint but also she's just so engaging, she's so funny and just such a great stage performer. This was a real star making moment for her. Not only keeping up with the rest of the cast that she is joining for this run but really proving herself as a standout. Georgina Onwara tremendous in this role. Absolutely loved her. She is opposite two different men, James Patrick Davis and Stavros Demetraki as Will Parker and Ali Hakim respectively. James as Will Parker is hilarious because he plays it so dumb and so slow and that's just a beautifully funny decision in this one. He gets so many laughs and it's all there in the text. It makes perfect sense for him to make these character choices when you look at the conversations that he has with Ali Hakim, he probably gets the most consistent laughs throughout the show. I do think that he and Georgina are robbed of more comedy opportunities when they sing the song All or Nothing in the second act. I love this song normally. And in this version, it does feel like a number that Daniel Fish took a look at and said, right, I have ideas in the seed leading up to this, and then we're gonna do the song. We're not really going to make anything of this. You're just going to sit there and the text is funny so it'll get some laughs, but you're not going to really do much with it. Then afterwards we have some more ideas. It just kind of felt like it was something they wanted to get through and they could have done more with. Meanwhile, Stavros as Ali Hakim is brilliant. He kind of plays Ali Hakim in a similar way that would fit right into the original production of the show, but then Ali Hakim has always had that sort of dubious energy about him anyway with his flirtatiousness and and his sort of comparatively contemporary sensibility, I suppose, with everyone else around him because he's a traveling salesman, he's a peddler. So that's part of his character. Liza Sadovi plays Aunt Ella and she is just brilliant. I saw her in Cabaret as Fräulein Schneider in her Olivier Award winning performance. She's nominated in the same category again this year at the Olivier's for Oklahoma. And the thing about Liza is she just puts so much detail into her character. They're just so well crafted and uh, she has some really interesting moments in the second act. Like I said, when she becomes the ringleader of this like community justice moment in the show's uncomfortable conclusion, and when she's the auctioneer in the picnic basket auction, she does some great things with it. She has some amazing funny one-liners, but she can also play intensity and fear and judgment so, so well. I saw so much just disgust and contempt in her eyes when she was looking at Judd throughout the performance. And that was a really interesting color, sort of a prejudice that she played Aunt Ella with. And normally she'd just be portrayed as this all-knowing maternal figure. So it was great to see her with a little bit more humanity and a little bit more sensuality to her as well. Yes, Aunt Ella, she deserves it. Speaking of Judd, Patrick Vale, sorely overlooked for an Olivier nomination for Best Featured Actor in a Musical. He is thrilling in this show. It's so, so interesting taking this classic maligned villain and making him human and vulnerable and raw and, and just so, so intriguing. The energy and the intimacy that he achieves with Arthur Darville as Curly when they're having this solemn, intense conversation in the darkness has to be a standout moment of the show. And then when he tearfully performs his song after that and everything else that he does on that stage, it's just blisteringly good. It's, it's so, so good. And it's not necessarily the flashiest performance. It's just honest and real and difficult and all of those interesting things.
So who do I think would enjoy this version of Oklahoma? I think this would be something great to go and see if you are someone who wouldn't have thought you'd necessarily enjoy this production because it is a classic, because you think it belongs with like the sound of music and the carousels and that lot. I think go and see this and you will be surprised. If you're at all interested in in a creative career on the stage or in lighting or in stage management, go and see this production because it's a fascinating study of things that can be achieved in a West End theatre. I think just all young theatre makers, if you want to go and see something current and vital and exciting, go and see Oklahoma at the Wyndham's Theatre. But those have been my thoughts about this version of the show. If you have been to see it already at the Wyndham's Theatre, let me know your thoughts in the comments section down below. Also, if you've seen this production anywhere else worldwide, let us know what you thought of it there as well. Thank you so much for watching today's video. I hope that you enjoyed. If you did, make sure to subscribe to my Stage YouTube channel for plenty more content, including many more reviews, coming very soon. I hope that everyone is staying safe and that you have a stagey day. For 10 more seconds, I'm Mickey Joe Theatre. Oh my god, hey, thanks for watching. Have a stagey day. Subscribe!